Good afternoon and welcome back to One Step at a Time Farming. I'm Lucas and I'm so happy to share our journey with you. And this is my abusive wife, Daniel. Okay, <laughs> not abusive, adorable, beautiful. That's what I mean to say, it came out wrong. Yes. Well. <laughs> okay, this is my lovely wife, Daniel. And. Yeah, I think today we just want to have another heart-to-heart -heart conversation, heart-to-heart -heart chat about the week that passed and share some of our failures and some of our victories with you, our accomplishments. Some were bittersweet and others were magnificent and glorious. Yeah, so let's get to it. I made a few notes. Okay, first of all, with the garden, thinking about some of my failures is that I plant the garden during the winter times using an app called, called Planter, which awesome, shows you the con companion planting, which plants are happiest with the others and what you can plant together and shows you the combative plants that you shouldn't plant together and also other beneficials like flowers that will call in beneficial insects or deter some pests. Wonderful app to you and it would have worked out perfectly if I stuck to my to my plan. <laughs> but I'm coming out of last year's garden and some obstacles that we faced there as well, having to move from the one property to the other and try and rescue our garden that we had there and to transplant it here and some things grew well and other things um, suffered a bit and some things completely, they grew wonderfully but failed to, to produce a crop. And learning from that, and there's also, I was maybe a bit over eager and zealous, so I planted vegetables that my family don't eat, <laughs> but it looked pretty. Actually, some of them were the most productive uh, plants, uh, speaking of kales and cabbages, purple cabbages, green cabbages stuff like that and my chickens had a feast we learned from the lesson and we went back to basics to plant what we eat and with that said we i decided to plant a lot more potatoes and actually the thing that triggered me in that <laughs> was that we had a a bunch of potatoes that sprouted potatoes that we bought from um, the market and didn't use it quickly enough um, so it sprouted and I stuck it in the ground and also it needs to be said that last year I didn't plant nearly enough okay we did plant some which was at the previous property and we harvested that and but we didn't eat it, we blessed another elderly couple in our community with it. But having harvest it at uh, that point of, in time, we saw that, you know, the couple of plants that I did have in the, in the ground wasn't enough to supply our home for a year. Um, so we decided, yeah, like I said, back to basics and to plant enough that will be sufficient for us. At this moment, we've got 48 potato plants in a dedicated raised bed garden. And I'm not sure whether it would be enough for the year, because we like potatoes, but it's 48 plants more than last year. And with a couple of plants and the harvest that we had, last year that we gave away i think you know, this should be quite a 
big step in the uh, direction of self-sufficiency. Okay, but that is where my planned garden went a bit astray because I uh, took up the space of one completely raised bed garden. It's not a loss, it's not a disaster, but I also maybe being a bit impatient and over eager, I think I started my seedlings, my seed race too soon. Yeah, I had a bad germination rate or no germination basically on our uh, uh, sweet peppers. Uh, which is bad, it is the last of the seeds that I used and after I realized you know, I didn't have germination in the sweet peppers we tried to buy seed but we couldn't find seed anywhere um, it's only last night that my wife could actually find a packet of of California Wonder sweet peppers in, in a grocery store and yeah so she bought that um, so yeah there was bad germination on the one side and also I started another couple of seeds a bit too soon for instance my uh, uh, winter squashes and that they germinated excellently um, but I had to get those uh, transplanted into the space where my peppers would have gone. Um, so yeah, my plans for the garden is a bit um, mixed up and I had to make changes and adapt and uh, uh, yeah, just try and recover from my own mismanagement in a sense <laughs> but yeah we adapted with between basically the tomatoes that I di directly uh, uh, sowed and the squashes the Hubbard squash basically these two clashes with uh, each other so between those I planted uh, our green uh, pole beans, the lazy housewife Ranadin, uh, which is a prolific uh, producer. Um, and basically it feeds both uh, nitrogen to both the tomatoes and um, to the uh, uh, winter squash. Um, and being that I can have uh, basically the tomatoes and the squash in the same bed because it's separated by the by the runner beans um, so yeah I had to make changes and adapt to that um, another thing is with the lettuce um, my lettuce was left in the uh, uh, ceiling trays too long because I'm struggling to find space for, the, for, uh, for them. The reason for that is <coughs> the fourth uh, raised bed garden uh, is one that we started as the winter started and I've got a lot of um, grass clippings and chicken manure and, and also the uh, bedding from the uh, brooder barn uh, that we've got in there but during the winter I didn't keep it wet enough so it's basically like a yugo culture uh, type of bed that I started there but the composting process weren't really active um, so I can't plant in that bed I've got a compost pile um, going there by the chickens, as you saw, uh, that we will uh, dress the top filling uh, with that so that we can utilize that, that garden. But yeah, um, so I couldn't get the lettuce into 
the ground and um, basically it started wilting away in the little seeding trays. So I had to transplant them as well between the tomatoes with some onions. Um, and actually this year I want to keep my tomatoes a bit spaced out more. Um, you know, to keep the, the heat between the plants down. Um, but I think adding the lettuce there now is doable uh, because it's a shorter season crop. Um, so by the times uh, before the tomatoes start producing, the lettuce uh, should be harvested already. So we'll be able to use that space. Um, <clears throat> Also, another thing that we always try and do is to success, uh, to practice succession sowing. So that we try and grow um, and utilize the beds almost the whole year if if we can. Um, but at this stage, we realized we've got a lot. We've got too little space and a lot more um, beds that we need to prepare. But at the moment, we don't have the soil and the compost for it. So it will be a process during the year. And I think if we can um, just add a race bed or two every month, then at the end of the day, uh, it should be fine. And then we'll basically do our planning month to month, planting month to month uh, this year, if possible. And basically that's a good thing because you know that every month you've got some uh, produce in the ground. And when you harvest your first plantings, your, let's say tomatoes, um, in the first bed, then the second bed where your tomatoes might be might only be starting but a month after that you can obviously you don't have this huge harvest harvest at one time but uh, uh you know a little bit a little bit every every month um and you know that will also take some pressure off of our garden space and off of um our harvest season as well. We basically spread our harvest season then over a couple of months instead of harvesting, at, you know, trying to harvest all at once. Okay, y'all, so that's the challenges, but we don't focus only on that. We learn from that. There were, there's blessings as well. Um, we had a late frost, for instance, and like I said, my potatoes sprouted early. I put them in the ground, um, came up beautifully. And then we had this late frost that, um, our black frost that hurt some of the potato plants. Um, and I was scared that I was going to lose all of them. Um, but I'm happy to say that all survived. Um, also with the uh, uh, green beans. Um, you know, I planted them a bit early. Um, but yeah, the champion, everything. Well, we lost, not due to the frost or anything, but I don't know if it's a cutworm or a mouse or something, but only two of my green beans were, you know, the stalks were broken. snipped off, broken. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It seems like it's snapped. Also, the herbert squash, the winter squash. Um, funny enough, the uh, Walton butternut squash didn't germinate yet. But the uh, Chicago 
water, green or blue, whatever. Harvard squash uh, germinated and um, started growing, you know, really well. So I had to transplant them, like I mentioned. Um, but it means that we, we have a good start on our squashes. Well, on our Harvard squash. Um, I didn't even plant zucchini yet. Um, or summer squashes. Um, but it's a good sign. It's, it's a blessing. Um, potato is truly a blessing. And then also... Uh, the sweet melons and watermelons, um, yeah, started germinating uh, now, and I've got about a week or so to find space for them. Um, and also another blessing, I think, that came out of it is that you know on the garden side is that I've got a couple of projects um, I have to build a couple of raised bed gardens so it's always nice to DIY and build something um, so it gives me something to do and I look forward to that um, And then, yeah, on the livestock side, we've only got chickens at the moment, <laughs> but we are one step closer to having our own uh, farm where we can raise more livestock. But we are blessed and grateful for the chickens that we do have at this moment. And, yeah, they help us get to the bigger picture. Yeah, so basically I've mentioned before in a previous video that uh, my winter project was to raise 100 um, day old broiler chickens for meat. Um, And the, it was actually raised that we will take uh, them to the abattoir and have the abattoir uh, process them so that we can sell the meat to our uh, community. And as soon as we had or uh, uh, received the chickens, uh, the chicks, um, we started marketing and we had some good uh, feedback from the community. Um, but when they reached the um, date to be processed, um, we had... We, we, yeah, we didn't get the sales as expected. Um, we sold a few and I thought, you know, people would line up. Um, yeah, so basically we expected a better response from our immediate community um, in our area. Um, and yeah, we did sell a few, but not nearly enough to justify, or the interest at that stage wasn't there to justify uh, taking them to the abattoir and uh, uh, taking on those expenses and then have them here in the freezer and nobody buys them. Um, so I decided to rather, uh, you know, to call the chickens myself and to process them myself and to stock our own uh, freezer for the house. 
um, you know, have a, a year's worth of chicken meat in the freezer. Um, and that's what we did. We are, well, I um, processed most of them. And at the end of the day, we get, uh, of course, some of the ends were still a bit small compared to the others. Um, so we decide, decided to uh, keep um, 20. Yeah, it's about 20 or so um, of the ends um, because at that stage as well I sold all my Brahma ends and our guardian dog also helped himself to a couple <laughs> but yeah it happens anyway um, so my wife, the wifey, abusive wifey, decided <laughs> decided to um, put, well to keep the ends for the four remaining Brahma roosters um, and to start. Air production and our own breeding program using the Brahma roosters with the uh, Cornish cross ends. Um, so that if we want to raise broilers again, we can hatch our eggs or else have the eggs, like she said, for egg production. And I was quite optimistic about it. Um, and it was fun. But then on Sunday, yeah, yeah, Sunday. Then on Sunday, um, we had a customer that stopped here, and he bought up all of our boiler two. We sold all of them, and that's where the bitter sweet. Uh, came in. Um, the bittersweet is the fact that we had a plan, we had to change and adapt. Our plans made another plan that seemed, um, you know, quite suitable and, and, and proper for our, our vision. Um, and then all <laughs> of a sudden, You've got somebody that wants to buy everything and you've got to make the choice. Okay, either get, because I mean, at the end of the day, the main goal is to have a, a diverse sources of income on the farmstead and selling the broiler chickens is one of those. So you've got to make the decision to either say, listen, okay, no, these aren't for sale, we're keeping them for uh, whatever, or the fact that um, sell them for the purpose that they were actually raised for. Um, and this uh, person actually wants us to raise about if you work it out about uh, four to six, four to six hundred uh, broilers a month. Well, that's he wants to buy a hundred every third day. Yeah, yeah, hundred every third day. So he asks us to please, you know, to keep going with the uh, the broilers, and he buys them live. Um, and he takes them to the abattoir on his um, cost and he's already got, you know, his existing customer base. Um, but he's running out of supplies and he wants, wants to procure us as one of his suppliers. Um, and yeah, that's where the bittersweet thing comes because now it feels like 
my wife's project that she wanted to do with the chickens is now again taking uh, priority on the back burner. But again, on the other hand, this creates a more re reliable source of income for us um, in the immediate future. Um, but a victory, but a sweet, but still a victory and a blessing at the end of the day. Um, yeah, and at this moment, I won't be able to supply him with a hundred chickens every third day, but I think we, we are for the short term, I'm going to try to do a batch of 100 and three weeks later start our second batch of 100. Um, and then, I mean, you've got 100 uh, chickens at the, uh, that you get rid of every six weeks until we can double that again and get to the point where we get to 400. Um, yeah, so that is the plan for the immediate future in, you know, on the chickens. Um, but again, I'm also, I feel blessed in the sense that um, we make back all our expenses on the live chickens that were sold during this time um, since they were um, harvest ready up to Sunday uh, the male chickens that we end up selling covered our cost um, on raising the broilers plus we've got a freezer full of chicken meat for basically a year Maybe a bit less, a little bit, a little bit less. Was, I mean, we eat chicken two to three times a week. Um, but the freezer is full. And so taking into consideration what we would have paid for our chicken meat during a month, um, that's already a saving, a huge saving as well. Um, so basically we are triple blessed on raising our own chickens because the cost for it for them is covered, the freezer is full and we save on our grocery bill. Four, four times blessed and it's, we know that they are healthy, free range chicken without any uh, medicines and drugs and funny stuff. Yeah, and all that. They are raised healthy. Um, and it's a blessing. Um, truly a blessing. Also, just the fact that the word spread um, basically to uh, another settlement a couple of kilometers away. Um, about our chickens is, is good. I mean, to have people traveling to us from another, is it another town, another settlement, um, to buy our chicken. I mean, that's, that's a good compliment. It's, it's a huge compliment. Um, yeah, so the benefits from that is we've got the opportunity to start generating a stable income from the farmstead without having to search for outside work um, and stuff like that. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a small step in the right direction where basically we can 
we won't be able to live off of you know the farm state now but at least the it's starting to trickle in some income yeah everything's starting to fall into place it's a sort of off the product and yeah uh, the cons is basically like I said uh, losing the parent flock for producing your own uh, broilers um, losing your experiment and losing the egg production but it's still something we can pick up also in the immediate future um, I think another thing is with them not being sold when we originally wanted to have them sold mm. you get attached to them Mm. They eventually start becoming like your pets. When they see you, they come to you. If you call, they come. They'll come and sit on your lap. Um, so you get used to having pets in such a sense. Yeah. And somebody comes and wants to buy one, and you're like, okay, it's one. And a little while later, another one gets sold, and then all of a sudden. You don't have any more chickens. Uh, you don't have any more pets. So it's it's sad. You get used to having them. You get used to your daily routine. They get used to a daily routine. Mm. And then the next moment they're gone. So it's an adjustment. It is sad. Yeah, it does. Uh, it's like when I had to uh, call the the chickens and process them it's uh, you know the fact that you spend time with them every day you feed them um, you water them you care for them see that they are all healthy and um, good but, like I say, you pet them as well. It's, it's like, I mean, there was a hundred, I think a hundred and three broilers altogether. Yeah. Um, but you, you've got a relationship with each and every single one of those little chicks up to the day when you say, hey, it's your one bad day <laughs> today. Um, and but I, I I have respect for the process for the sacrifice in that as well um, because we know how our chickens were raised the care and love that they receive while they were with us um, and it's not like you know it's one of the factory farms where they stuck in a little cage or in a little space and basically just force fed to get to a point where they get killed um, I think they had a good life and, and it, it's one of the most difficult things that I had to do to uh, take their lives, to end their lives, but also it was um, a sacred and honorable thing to do because you value their sacrifice and you call them in a very respectful way. Um, I know for you and Michaela, our daughter, 
it was a very difficult period <laughs> to go through and my son you know he would jo join me in <clears throat> the process of culling the chickens <coughs> and I think he went through the same emotions um, that I did but he like a man he stuck it through and um, helped me helped me sculpt them helped me clean them helped me viscerate them and helped me portion and pack them um, you know f for a day or two other days you were at school and I continued I did about 14 18 a day in the beginning, it was six. <laughs> the, no, the first day was six, but I did two rounds. It was 12 on the first day. And then, yeah, eventually I worked up to culling about 18 a day. And every single time that I take my knife and say a prayer, thanking God, for the opportunity and thanking the chicken for his sacrifice. Um, it is an emotional but sacred moment. Um, it's not a fun thing to do, but I think it gave me a near respect for the food that we eat. Um, it's not a faceless packaged slice of meat that you get at the grocery store anymore. It's, it's, it was a living, breathing, and most of all, a relational being that was sharing his life with our lives and which is now also a nutrition and sustenance for our bodies. Um, but it does it touches you in a way that you you really can't describe until you go through the process yourself. Um, and it's an honor. It's, it really is a difficult, it's also a bit bittersweet. It's a difficult thing to do, but it's irreverent, it's sacred, it's Yeah, difficult to explain. But on a good note, um, we kept one egg. Uh, it's my wife brought it in a while ago. I just could we want to go and fetch it. Baby bird. Mommy bird. Okay. This girl now truly made it to pet status. Um, She's one of the hens that we put with the Brahma roosters but they immediately, because the Brahma roosters, Brahma roosters came into their sexual maturity um, and they are worse than teenage boys. <laughs> Um, so basically, are they try to mate with this little girl, and in the process injured her. So we separated her with a friend, another lady, 
outside of the cage and she basically made herself comfortable at night here on our patio or in the house where she sleeps or <laughs> yeah, just in the doorway of the house um, but she's still recovering um, after because the, they really bullied her and injured her and nothing is broken um, and we're grateful for that but yeah she immediately came into her own as a pet and reached pet status so she's not for sale she's my my wifey's little baby now the <coughs> the dog and the cats accepted her as part of the pet family and they'll play with her, they'll be around her, they'll guard her um, and she's, I mean she's comfortable um, her feathers are starting to grow back here on her back but yeah she's quite chatty, if you walk past her she'll call you and then you have to wrap her rest and sometimes just pick her up and give her some love and then she's happy okay she's got a name now <laughs> so i think a valuable lesson that we can take from this week is um, to stay adaptable uh, to change and yes to plan ahead make your plans but also be adaptable you know when things change um, and I just want to encourage you with the word of God as well um, Proverbs 19 verse 21 yeah um <laughs> thank you <laughs> um, many are the plans in a man's hours. proverbs 19 verse 21 many plans are in a man's heart but the counsel of the lord will stand um we can make, make plans and plans will change. But if you submit to the guidance and the leadership of our Father, um, it is His will, His counsel, His advice at the end of the day that will prevail. Um, and sometimes we get so caught up in our own plans, in our own will, in our own desire. Um, and we try and be so rigid and, you know, fix everything, set it in stone. And then we quickly want to come very despondent, is the correct word. Uh, when things don't go according to plan um, but instead of feeling despondent and unmotivated or seeing it as a failure uh, go to Abba Father and sit at his feet and ask him for counsel ask him for advice ask him um, you know lay, lay your heart bare in front of have a father and say I don't understand I've planned this I've done everything right I've put so much effort in and things don't go according to plan but hear from from have a father what is his will what is his desire what is his plan even with the little things um, in our lives um, and as things change, adapt to it. 
we had an idea or a mission to raise royalists, to take it to the abattoir, you know, to have it processed there so that we can have the seal to sell, sell the meat. But then the interest wasn't there as it seemed like in the beginning. Um, and we had to adapt and change. We processed the chicken, or most of it ourselves, and filled our fridge. Those that were left over, we made a plan to have it as our air production, um, you know, on the side, and uh, also our uh, breeding flock for, you know, broilers uh, in the future. The plan changed again. But if you look at it, at the end of the day, all our costs are covered, our fridge is full, and it actually worked out for us in this specific moment in life, actually more beneficial. And that wasn't my plan, that wasn't your plan, but ultimately it's Father's plan, and it was better than what we thought. And with that is the additional blessing that we now have the opportunity to raise broilers and we've already got an offset point um, and that will generate income for us so just trust father uh, when things don't go your way submit yourself to god um, yeah, so I don't think anybody should feel when going into homesteading or actually any point of life that the things you plan are going to turn out the way you want them to. Um, my husband can be very plan orientated a lot of times with Very rigid. <laughs> things um, me as well with other things but yeah sometimes your plans turn out the way you want maybe not when you want mm -hmm. but they do and other times you change your plans three four five times but in the end of the day don't get despondent if things don't turn out the way you want and when you want them. It will happen the way God intended. On God's time, we must just listen and yeah, learn to be patient. Patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. As a yeah, anyway, so yeah, we just wanted to share everything going on. Um, it's nice being busy, it's nice being in spring season. Um, it's nice being able to stick my hands in the garden and planting. <laughs> and yeah, we just want to thank you for spending time with us today and um, listening to our heart-to-heart -heart conversations, um, sharing in our joy, sharing in our sadness. lessons, failures, <laughs> sadness, um, and yeah, we truly just appreciate you spending time with us. God bless you and we love you. See you next time. Next time. <laughs>